Welcome to the first of our uh, Psychology 1100 uh, um, module lectures. Uh, this covers material from Quiz 1. Um, I've divided it into two parts um, corresponding to the different modules. So in part one, um, you'll hear about a couple of concepts from Y Science. Um, in part two, you'll hear about a few concepts from History of Psychology. And then remember part three, um, research designs is actually something that we'll do in class. Here's the outline that you provided for me through the discussion board for quiz one material. Uh, remember, we'll be doing research designs in class, and so these lectures are just going to cover why science and history of psychology. Um, this first one, why science alone, um, specifically empirical methods and ethical research. I did decide that uh, I would combine the topics generated by both classes, I think ultimately that's going to end up being uh, a, fair amount, a fair amount more helpful um, because you will have uh, access to more concepts. Um, and so plan for that to probably be the case moving forward throughout the semester. Uh, so within the My, My Science module, and notice um, empirical methods appears pretty near the beginning, um, so you might suspect that it's a pretty important concept. Oftentimes, I am not simply going to define and give an example of the very concept that you asked about. It's often much more useful for me to put it into context to show how it's related to nearby concepts. Um, it's really a form of analysis, which again, that's one of the things we're really shooting for here. So you notice systematic observation, right? and there's its definition, and empirical methods, we say these empirical methods, so systematic observations are a type of empirical method approaches to inquiry that are tied to actual measurement and observation. Um, now, I'm with you. I, I think that that's actually not a particularly helpful definition. So I'll certainly um, try and improve upon that. Um, but let's also consider the relationship between um, these different concepts. So we've got empirical methods. Might lead you to wonder, are there non-empirical methods? And the answer is, of course. might seem like they're not covered in the textbook, but actually they are. Um, there is the key type of non-empirical method mentioned in the history of psychology module. So I'll tell you about that in a few minutes. But remember, from the textbook, it said systematic observations are a type of empirical method. For a contrasting concept, let's actually call them casual or everyday observations. So here's our organizing scheme. Empirical methods. Empirical methods are simply observations that take place in the outside world. 
right? So if you go out in the hall after class and see two people walking together holding hands, that's an empirical observation. You observed something that's happening out in the world. If somebody is filling out a questionnaire, right, and, and you are observing the responses that they give, right, that's an empirical observation. It happened out in the world. So you might think, well, gee, isn't that every type of observation? And the answer is, well, no, not necessarily. There are observations that can take place someplace else, and that's the non-empirical type of observation, and that someplace else is inside your own head. Right. So if you close your eyes right now and picture your favorite location in the world, right, are you observing that in the world right now? No, you're observing that in your own head. Um, and that is precisely what introspection is. In the next mini lecture, I'll go into a little bit more detail about introspection, but for now, just realize it is the primary form of non-empirical observation. So then back to empirical methods or empirical observations. We want to think about systematic observation and then casual observation. So these are all the types of observations that you can make out in the world. Casual observation. Well, I already described one of them. You're out, you go out in the hall after class and you watch two people holding hands. You say, oh, yeah, but they're holding hands. Um, that is an everyday observation. Okay? That's not a scientific observation. To make it a scientific observation, we're going to make it systematic. Really, all that means is it's a much, much, much more careful observation. All right, we're going to have a set of rules, or if you want, a system of rules that you're going to have to follow in order to make these observations. So, for example, there is a research design called um, naturalistic observation, and it basically tells you what you need to do in order to make those observations, right? So keep in mind, if you say, gee, I'm a people watcher. I love going out to the library or going to the go into the, to the cafeteria and just watching people talk and kind of imagining what kind of conversations they're having, those are not systematic observations. Those are casual observations. Those are everyday observations. It's when you make your observations in the context of a very, very carefully designed research study. That's what makes it systematic. Let's move on to ethics. I do think the definition is uh, a little bit tricky because they actually sneak in um, two parts of ethics, but the text itself really just covers the, the first part, the um, protecting research participants from potential harm. Um, the other part of it, um, and it is actually worth pointing out, is uh, steering scientists away from conflicts of interest. Um, or other situations. Um, the way to think about it is, you know, it turns out that uh, um, sometimes research is funded by a company. Um, and um, when that happens, a lot of times the research, surprise, um, finds results that uh, advantage or in favor of that company. When a researcher conducts research, um, they have to def divulge their funding sources. So if there is a potential conflict of interest like that, um, people would be able to, to evaluate it and know. All right, but again, the main part is how we treat our research participants. So first we've got informed consent. Um, if you're going to be a research participant, um, you basically have the right to know what you're in for. Um, so we have to 
um, describe the research procedures to you. We basically have to tell you everything that you might need to know that might make you decide you don't want to be in there. Okay? But you will notice it says, in general. And so it's not the case that for every single solitary study, we have to get informed consent. Um, the main time you don't need to get informed consent is if you are doing some kind of observational study of behavior that occurs out in a public location. Right? So if you want to watch um, um, people shopping in the mall, um, you're basically allowed to do that without getting permission. Now, you might need to get permission from the mall owners, but you don't need to get permission from the participants. Confidentiality, um, we may be collecting uh, information, you know, personal information about our research participants, um, and we basically make a promise that we are not going to uh, share that personal information unless the research participant specifically gives us permission to do so. Third, benefits. Um, researchers should consider the benefits. Um, actually, it, it turns out it's not really the researchers that often make this decision. It's actually an institutional review board. This is a committee um, at whatever college or university is conducting the research that will decide um, what's the potential benefit of this research. Might we learn something very, very, very important? Um, and then if so, that might justify um, a research study that's a little bit more um, um, shaky on ethical grounds, one that maybe causes people some extra stress um, or something like that. Um, and again, that question is something you need to ask every time. You know, what are the benefits um, and what are the risks? And then finally, deception. Um, you know, it turns out um, that uh, a lot of times if we were to fully divulge the purposes of a research study, it wouldn't work. Right? So for example, um, think about the, the needle memory um, demonstration that we did at the beginning of the semester. Uh, suppose I was doing that as a research project and I told you beforehand, hey, I want to find out, can I get you guys to misremember the word needle? Uh, and of course it wouldn't happen. I have to actually withhold that information um, and that is a form of deception. Um, and the problem with deception is it interferes with informed consent. Right? Um, if we are not telling you the truth about the study, then how can you make consent being fully informed about it? Um, so what we do in those cases is we often will allow researchers, um, because again, the research wouldn't work otherwise, we will allow researchers to get away with um, some forms of deception, but when we do, um, we are absolutely required at the end um, to explain. Right? That's this idea of debriefing. We have to explain the purposes of the study. Um, we have to explain how the deception occurred, why the deception occurred, why it was, why it was important to do that. 